welcome to our service, wherever you are watching. The Stations of the Cross The Stations of the Cross are a meditation on the Passion of our Lord. And in this meditation, this series of meditations, we are led to express sorrow for the times when we have failed Jesus and we are assured of his forgiveness. So as we go through the stages, the stations of the cross, let us think seriously about its meaning for Jesus and for us. We stand before the cross the cross on which our Lord hung to redeem humankind. As we meditate on the way of his passion, let us remember that it was for us that he was crucified. May it help us to be truly sorry for the times when we have failed him and strengthen us to take up our cross and follow him in our lives. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. As the disciples were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him and on the third day he will be raised. And they were greatly distressed. Pilate could find no fault in Jesus, but he handed him over to the people. A weak ruler, swayed by a violent crowd. It made little difference to Pilate whether one Jew lived or died, and it enabled him to obtain from the crowd the useful affirmation that they had no king but Caesar. So Pilate handed him over to them. We may like to think that we would not be part of the crowd, and yet in each one of us is the voice which cries, Crucify him! For every time we fail Jesus, we join our voice to those of the angry crowd. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one for whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities, and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. The procession to the execution began, and Jesus, though weak from continuous questioning, mocking, and beating, was made to carry his own cross. He was led away as a common criminal, to suffer one of the most degrading forms of execution ever invented. But the burden that Jesus had to carry was much greater than the physical weight of the cross, for he also had to carry the sins of us all. So let us offer our sorrow to the times when we have added to this burden. In his anguish he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Weakened by the unbearable torments that he had already gone through, the added weight of the cross was too much for Jesus, and he fell. As he lay there, the cry of anguish that he was later to utter cannot have been far from his lips. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We sometimes feel that God has forsaken us 
and does not answer our prayers. But we, like Jesus, must know in our hearts that however far away God seems to be, he never forsakes us. God is always faithful. And Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary had brought up her son through many hardships and cared for him as a loving mother. Now she saw him being led to his death a little over 30 years of age. Was this really what he had meant when he said, did you not know that I must be busy with my father's affairs? Certainly this was the sword that Simeon had predicted would pierce her soul. But Mary, unlike most of the disciples, did not desert her son in his time of need, but stood by him to the end. Let us ask that we too may have a faith like Mary to stand by Jesus whatever the cost. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which the two did the will of his father? Jesus was so weak that the soldiers were afraid that he may not reach the place of execution. So they forced a passer-by to carry his cross. Simon no doubt tried to refuse, but in the end he did carry the cross. Only the day before the disciples had insisted that they would remain faithful, faithful to Jesus, whatever happened. But first they fell asleep in the garden, and then, after the arrest, they ran away. How like the parable that Jesus had told, where it was the unwilling son who in fact did what his father wanted. Words and empty promises are not enough. We, like Simon, must take up our cross and share in Christ's passion in our daily lives. The king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. In a great act of kindness, a woman stepped forward from the crowd and wiped the blood-stained face of Jesus. A few days earlier, another woman had anointed Jesus with costly perfume. A few hours later, a man would give Jesus his tomb. All of these were acts of love and charity to the Lord. And we can perform similar acts of charity to Jesus, living now in our sisters and brothers who are in need. For whatever we do to help one another, we do it for Jesus. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in a deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. A little further along the road, Jesus stumbled and fell again. He must have felt so utterly exhausted and desolate that he could not possibly go any further. But he had to go on to fulfil his father's will. And so again he struggled to his feet and carried on. Sometimes we too feel that things are hopeless, that we cannot go on. But we too have God's work to do. And we too must continue with trust and faith 
in the power of Jesus working in us. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, desolate. Some pious women began to weep for Jesus and tried to console him. But he told them not to weep for him, but for themselves and for their children. Jesus was in agony, and yet he refused their consolation, not through ingratitude, but because he knew the agony that they and others would suffer because of their rejection of him. When we feel rejected or badly treated, we must remember the example of Jesus. We must still remember others who are suffering, perhaps more than we are, and who need our help and compassion, and not let ourselves become caught up in self-pity. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Three times Jesus resisted the temptation of Satan. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus fell on the way to Calvary. And just as Peter forgave so just as Jesus forgave Peter, even that threefold denial, so he will forgive us if we turn to him in penitence. No sin is too great for Jesus to forgive, so long as we are truly sorry, and are prepared to rely on his love and forgiveness, rather than on our own efforts. Even after this third and heaviest fall, Jesus once again struggled to his feet and continued. And so must we, even in the moment of our greatest fall, we must not lose hope, but get up and continue with faith in our Lord's merciful love. We brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. The journey was over. They had arrived at the place of execution. First, they stripped Jesus of his clothing, and so he ended his life as he had begun, with nothing. We have clothing and enough food, and many other comforts that we rightly enjoy. But we must not become so involved with the things of the world that we lose sight of what really matters. We must keep our sight firmly fixed on God and be ready to accept whatever comes to us in his name, even to being left with nothing. Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross in a gesture of forgiveness for the whole world. Before he died, he, has he had time for two further particular acts of forgiveness. First, he forgave his executioners, even as they hammered in the nails. Then he forgave the penitent thief who was crucified with him. Just as Jesus forgave them, so he always forgives us when we sin. And so also must we forgive others who wrong us. We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, Christ the power of God 
and the wisdom of God. Jesus hung on the cross for only a short time. The mental and physical torments that he had suffered had taken all of his strength. He commended his spirit to his father and died. It was all over. But of course, it was not all over, was it? It was only the beginning. Christ had to die so that we could live. As the soldier pierced his side, out flowed the blood and the water that was to seal the new and everlasting covenant between God and the world. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus hung dead on the cross. And so now did the two thieves. The crowds had gone home. The soldiers had left. Silence descended on Calvary. The body of Jesus was taken down from the cross and laid in Mary's arms. Now she carried her son's lifeless body in her arms, as once she had carried his unborn body in her womb. For this death was the prelude to new life. All of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. The body of Jesus was placed in the tomb, but not even the power of death could hold him. Christ had to die and be buried before he could rise again. In the, same, in the same way, we too have to die and be buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, so that we too can rise again to new life with him. Let us then try to live that risen life here on earth, so that when our time comes to die, we may pass through the gates of death to new and everlasting life with Jesus. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Early on that first Easter morning came the shattering revelation that the death of Christ was not the end. From death and despair came life and hope. Christ has risen from the dead to destroy death and give us everlasting life. We have meditated on Christ's suffering and death. We have expressed our sorrow for our failings and have asked his forgiveness. Now let us rejoice in his resurrection and go out in joy to live the risen life on earth and to share the good news with others. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.